Hey friends, this is Joe. This is episode, I don't know, 128, I think, of the Decahedron RPG podcast. It's been a while since I've done an all feedback show. You know, I was trying a strategy where I would do a short topic and answer feedback at the end. And um, I thought that would keep me on track, but <laughs> it didn't. So this is an all feedback show, uh, mail call as we call it. call from the United States of America. All right. So like I said, we have a lot of uh, feedback. You know, I don't see a lot of people doing this on YouTube. Um, it's very much a podcasting thing, but since this is a podcast that just happens to be on YouTube, we're going to do it. Um, all right. I'm, all my stuff is down here. So you see me looking down there. So our first feedback is from episode... 116 uh, in that episode i talked about how i was setting up this campaign and i was a little frustrated because the players were like okay when are we going to play when are we going to play you know i was doing all my prep and i was like finally ready and i was like okay well we made your characters a while ago i i would like to see your equipment lists and crickets right and uh and this is what that feedback is about hey joe crawley here been slack on the calls to shows lately uh, but i just wanted to call in and say i've been enjoying listening this is going back a few episodes but you expressed some frustration about trying to organize a game um, where you were uh, more committed and or engaged or enthusiastic uh, than your players and i think this is pretty common between you know gms and, and players this imbalance you know gms have to be engaged outside the actual game you know, it's part of the enjoyment of the task, world building, etc. Whereas players, they just have to be engaged for the few hours you're actually at the table. You know, sometimes they don't manage that. But I think this is sometimes it's it's fine. But I and others, you know, find myself wanting players, even as a player, I find my fellow players, uh, you know, wanting them to have the same enthusiasm as me. And, and engage with the game between uh, sessions, you know? Part of solving this is likely just a reframing of mindset, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on what we can do as, as GMs and players to resolve this, you know? Is it just worrying about it less? Or you know, how do we go about getting players to be more engaged or enthusiastic? Anyway, as I said, enjoy the shows. Take care. Bye. Hey, Riley, thanks for that. By the way, Riley is the host of a podcast called the Diegetic Advancement Podcast. I will put a link below. And uh, anyway, yeah, thanks for that. I'm going to pick up my notes here. So uh, first thing, Slack and calls. You know, nobody owes me a phone call. I very much appreciate them. Uh, phone calls, emails, YouTube comments now. Uh, I very, very much appreciate them, but nobody owes them to me. Um, on the other hand, I also say that's my kind of my my driving force that's how i know that someone's listening to me like if i never hear anything from anybody i think i would give up pretty quick so i i super appreciate it but again it's it's a favor not a duty <laughs> yeah you're right the gm absolutely has to be more engaged the amount of work it takes to create a scenario and you know i don't run in pre-generated campaign settings so you know the setting and then the scenario and all that um, but it's something I love, so I don't mind, right? It's like, oh, no, I have to make a new planet. No, I love that stuff, man, right? Um, it's like, as a player, you know, making a character. I love making a character, making that backstory. You know, who are they? How do they think? What makes them tick? Uh, and doing that as a larger scale, like on a society for a town or a village or a nation or a planet or a galactic empire. <gasps> oh, <laughs> I love it. I seriously love it. Um, so yeah, GMs have to be more engaged. And maybe that's why GMs become GMs. Maybe that's the secret sauce, right? Is because they are the ones who like doing that stuff. Uh, and players only have to show up. And you know, I'm a big fan of not requiring too much of my players. You know, a lot of people I hear... Um, say, you know, here, here's this hundred page background for the world. Be familiar with it. Hyperbole a little bit there, but that's not me. Um, I expect you to show up 
And while I do have stuff there for people that like it, I usually put it on a site called Campaign Wiki. Um, it's, it's like a, a wiki for RPG campaigns and it's free. Um, I should do a review of that someday because it has pluses and minuses. I used to use this one called Obsidian Portal. Um, yeah, that should be another review too. But uh, Campaign Wiki is my my one of choice these days. I suppose I could self-host something on my, my own domain, but yeah. Uh, anyway, so I put that stuff there because there's players that like it. Like James, he, he likes diving into the world. Um, he is also a player that is engaged like... I'm having the same problem in the Tunnels and Trolls game I'm planning. Actually, it's planned. Um, there's three players. There's James and there's two others. And in Tunnels and Trolls, it's it's harder to balance encounters and stuff than D&D. And equipment plays a huge role in your character's abilities. And James made his character. All three made their character. James has given me his equipment list i have it we work together it's great you know he gave it to me i gave him some feedback back and forth it's great the other two not a word and then again same thing in traveler james i have all his stuff his character's done and the other two nothing crickets and i think they heard maybe heard that in a uh, episode and they were like oh yeah no we we want to play we want to play and i'm like great just give me the list and then uh back to nothing you know i I don't know. Um, and I think a part of that is my fault for the way, because I'm planning on doing it for the podcast. Um, and maybe maybe I need to let that go. Because um, I don't want the first session to be, well, I'm trying to do both games in just one session. And I don't want to have a whole bunch of time there for shopping and all that stuff. But maybe I need to let that go. Maybe do a session zero for both. Usually session zeros I view as for a campaign, not for a one shot. These are both one shot adventures. Um, and maybe just let them use game time to do all that stuff. And then I'm there to answer their questions. Well, how does armor work in Traveler? It's very different than other RPGs. Um, actually, I guess it's pretty close to like the original Chainmail kind of thinking about it anyway um yeah eh. uh you said it's a matter of reframing our mindset yeah and by that i'm assuming you mean that us as gms we need to lower our expectations of what we expect from our players and know that this is what they're going to do they're not going to do anything until it's game night and then they're going to show up and then after game night it's all going to uh, uh, <laughs> exit their brain until the next game and expecting anything more than that is probably expecting too much. I don't know. <laughs> is that a pessimistic view? Let me know. As a player, what? yes, players out there, most of you are more players than GMs. As a player, tell me, am I asking too much? How much are you willing to put into the game outside of game night? Um... Uh, and then you kind of elicited my advice. You know, well, it's my thoughts, how to, fit. I don't know. That's, I, if I had the answer, I would do an episode about that. Every GM in the world would uh, watch it. I would go viral. I'd be a millionaire. I'd quit my job and uh, play games the rest of my life. <laughs> Thank you very much for that call, Riley. Hey, our next feedback is from episode 121. In that episode, I was joined by James and Dark Fluid, and we each had made a Minotaur Thief. And that was kind of at the request of Jason, because in another episode, James and I both made Thieves, and uh, James had started to make a Minotaur Thief, but then we changed it mid, uh, mid character creation. And Jason wrote and said, I'd like to see the Minotaur Thief. So the three of us each made Minotaur Thieves, and we presented them. And I went to my Niagara Falls job, and this, this young guy I work with, really great guy, uh, but young. I remember being that young. Um, but his name is Blade, which is a cool name, and it's not a nickname or anything. It's actually, you know, you look on his license, his name is Blade. And he's, he's not a vampire hunter. He does not look like Wesley Snipes, and I do not think he would get that reference. He is so young. <laughs> anyway, uh, 
he gave me this feedback. Hey, I'm going to present it as if it came in as an email because it's hard to present a conversation. So this is what Blade said. I just listened to episode 121. Great episode. I really like the idea of a minotaur thief. Of the three, I like dark fluids the best. Hey, Blade. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for liking the idea of a minotaur thief. Yeah, I thought that was kind of cool. Different ways to approach it, though, right? When James first told me the idea, I didn't like the way he was taking it, which is why we ended up cha changing the race. But... Um, the the three that came out, yeah, I think they were I think they were all good. Uh, of course, I like mine the best because you know I made it the way I like it. But um, yeah, blade. I mean, dark fluids. Um, what was that? Astonishing swordsman? Did he use or did he use barbarians of Lemuria? Ah, whichever. Uh, very different type of game system than the one I use. I use fate accelerated, very loosey goosey. And you know, when I was your age, when I was your age. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was your age, I, th I was probably more into the crunchy games, too, than the, the loosey-goosey story games. So, yeah, I get it. Uh, thanks very much for listening, and thanks for the feedback. Our next set of three feedbacks is from, is, are from episode 124, which I called um, Against the Jade Dragon Clan, but now I'm calling the Flying Fish Jade Dragon setting. That was a RPG campaign idea I had uh, based very, very loosely on my memories of an old TV show called Tales from the Gold Monkey. Yeah, uh, Flying Boat, that's the Flying Fish and the Flying Fish and the Jade Dragon. You know, Flying Boat in the South Pacific um, during World War II, but before the U.S. involvement in World War II, but a very, again, loosey-goosey with the history of the time frame uh, just to make the story more interesting. And, you know, that's kind of how the original show was, too. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, listen to the feedback. First one, and when I say first, these are arranged alphabetically. So the first one came from Evil Jeff. Yo, Evil Jeff. All right, Tales from the Gold Monkey time. Man, I remember that show being on uh, Sunday night, 8 o'clock. That was one of the shows that, one of the, I can pretty much remember that we all sat down to watch. There might have been other ones before that, but that was definitely one of those shows that uh, my dad was interested in. And just the whole setup was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I like your idea. Um, that was a campaign I'd play in. How long you could play in it, um, I guess yeah, the I mean, if the characters are on certain missions, I guess there's certain things that we they're trying to do. So you're getting directives from somebody else. I mean, I guess the GM is basically, oh, here's today's plot. So it's not exactly railroady in that aspect. Um, but in that environment, the characters are going to be kind of limited in what they could do. I mean, they could be running certain jobs on a regular basis, supplies and things like that, um, maybe seeking out things, but I guess there are certain directives that they would have. But, yeah, for a uh, short campaign, I definitely would uh, enjoy playing in that environment. Uh, and I think rule systems, I think you can still get away with uh, fudge or fade in there. Um but, yeah, I think having something a little bit more mechanical for the combat is definitely needed. Appreciate the show. Keep it up. Hey, Evil Jeff. By the way, everyone, Evil Jeff is the host of a podcast himself. That podcast is called the Minions and Musings Podcast. Links down below. You remember the show. That surprised me. That is one of those memories I have. And like when I talk about it to other people, nobody else remembers the show and you remember it. So that's awesome. That's great. That that makes me happy. Uh, maybe it's because we're both into this, you know, adventure fantasy type thing. I think it came out, you know, I was trying to uh, ride the coattails of Indiana Jones. And um, I don't know how successful it was. I, I think it was moderately successful, but it was expensive to produce. 
Um, and that's not a good combination. That's kind of what killed the original Battlestar Galactica. It was moderately successful, but it was very expensive to produce. Um, I would have liked it if they did their original idea, but getting off topic. You said that you don't know how much of a campaign it could be. Like it would be a one shot or a limited campaign. I think you're going to have a full campaign. Um, pretty much. This is Traveler in the South Pacific of World War II. Instead of having planets, you have islands or seaports. You know, it could even be inland things on lakes and rivers. Uh, but it boils down the same. You, you have your star ports. Um, and every city or town or village you go to, you can generate like a traveler planet. And while I had this government agent part in there, that's not their full-time gig. They're not being bankrolled full-time. They're like freelancers. And when their handler has something they can do, he or she contacts them and they get paid for that. But other than that, they have to scrape together to get by. And you say, well, why are they doing it? Then they're doing it for the cause, but they still need to pay the bills. So um, if you watched last week's episode where I did that little bit from 76 Patrons and I showed one random um, adventure from Traveler from 76 Patrons about the two couple, the two the couple that wants to get out of their parents' reach, you could totally call that an episode or a plot line or whatever. So you said uh, it would probably be railroady. I, I don't think, well, you didn't even say railroady, uh, but you were worried that it might lean towards that way. I do agree that it would, it would work wonderfully for episodic play this week's episode, but still you could have these recurring uh, villains and recurring NPCs, heroes and stuff that they interact with. I, I, I really think it would work. I think it would work for a long-term campaign if the player interest and everything was there for, for it. Uh, then you talked uh, gaming system, uh, fate, fudge, always always something you can go to uh for almost anything but like you said yeah i wanted something media for the ship combat rules and that ended up being its own episode anyway that was episode number 125 where i just did my own rules so thanks very much for that feedback evil jeff our next feedback is an email and it was from james James doesn't have a podcast, but he is a longtime um, guest host here. He's on fairly frequently. And this is what James had to say. I just listened to episode 124 against the Jade Dragon Clan. I remember tales from the Gold Monkey. Hmm. I actually found it on YouTube. I started re-watching and I gotta say, it's cheesy and not in a good way. My memories are better than the actual show. You talked about using Traveler's Starship Combat for World War II airplanes. Have you checked out Steve Jackson's Car Wars? It is the best tabletop game I've ever played for that kind of thing. One last thing. Am I really that bad at bouncing ideas around with you? You made it sound like I shut you down all the time. Hey, I may not always love your most out there concepts, but I'm always down to brainstorm with you, man. Hey, James, thanks for that. So from the top down, another person that remembers Tales from the Gold Monkey. I thought I was the only one. That's awesome. Um, yeah, great. We watch it on YouTube. It's cheesy. Yeah, I'm trying to avoid it. You told me that. I was tempted to go watch it, but I'm trying to avoid watching it while I'm getting these ideas out because I don't want to copy the show. Um, I want to go with the feeling of the era from what I remember and then the other bits I've added in from other shows and stuff. Um, like only angels have wings. I think that's a good influence in Car Wars. I love the setting. Don't like the don't like the rules, I think. <laughs> I've looked at them. Like the first page is like it's like a huge chart, right? And I, I don't want to do all these charts and look up another chart and another chart. And it's a it's a very from what I can tell, it's a very meaty, crunchy, complex game, and that's not what I want. And I realized when I talked about the game system, I glazed over the the star uh, the starship, <laughs> the flying plane combat, the the aerial combat, and it's pretty much you know the the combat roll. You know you make your defense roll. If you fail it, you roll a damage roll, and I have a little chart for which part of the plane is now damaged, and then your flight mechanic can try to repair it, but. There's rules for all that. And that's the part I like. Oh, that engine is out. And yes, I'm willing to bet that Car Wars does something like that. Because that's how 
Steve Jackson is, but the re- it's it's just it's it's too complex for my style of play at this stage of my life, um, and so I I hadn't considered it. And once you said it, I briefly considered it. And like I said, I I even uh, looked at it, and I'm like, no, nah, that's that's too much. As for bouncing ideas off of you, I mean, this this I I don't know if this is a public forum is a place for this conversation. Um, you always say what you don't like, and you never say what you like, and it's kind of a downer, you know. It's like Mary Poppins, you know, spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. You know, I know that anything I make, there's going to be good parts and there's going to be bad parts. I mean, that's true of everything. That's why when we do reviews on this show, I do it the way I do it. The three things I like, the three things I don't like. And you give me the three you don't like. You never give me the three you like, which makes me think that the whole thing sucks or that you hate the whole thing. And it's just, it, it brings me down. And, uh, you know, there's that old thing in management, the compliment sandwich. Although, it's really the complaint sandwich, right? Because you, you can call it a bread sandwich. Anyway, uh, you know, you give a compliment, you give the criticism, and then you give another compliment, right? Start high, end high, uh, other stuff in the middle. So, um, yeah, if, if, if you gave everything, that'd be okay. Um, but saying only what you like or only what you don't like, that that's not uh, very helpful. The best feedback, you know, when you're developing that stage, you're looking for feedback, you know, what's good, what works and what doesn't. And, and you need both parts of that to be effective. And, uh, but hey, that's nothing on you. You know, we're, we're, we're buds forever, dude. When did we meet? 1978? 77? I don't know. Long time ago. Anyway, uh, thanks for the feedback, sir. You rock. You're a great friend. Our next feedback, also for episode 124. It's the last one for this episode. This one is from Jason. I, I don't know what to say about Jason. I mean, he's a great guy, all that. I mean, no, I, he used to have a podcast. He might have a podcast again. He, I don't know what to say. Hey, Joe, just listen to the first 12 minutes of your episode, 12 minutes, 30 seconds of your episode and against the Jade Dragon plan. And I would definitely play in that game. I would definitely run in that game. In fact, I was getting ready to run that game at a convention. I had to drop out, so I didn't get to run it. I was going to use Dicey Tales. So Savage Worlds would definitely work, but Dicey Tales is a pulp version of Barbarian's Lemuria. So you have the Barbarian's Lemuria career system for skills and the pulpy feel of that game, but adapted for 30s pulp. The other game, if you wanted something lighter, would be one-shot RPG pulp rules. These just came out. If you search for a one-shot RPG on drive through or look at my, my latest episode where I interview the author, the or a, a fairly recent episode where I interview the author, you'll see how to find it on drive through But their pulp rules are out now, and I think they would work really well for this game. I like the setting. I remember Tales from the Gold Monkey. I watched it when it came out, and I've got it on DVD. I don't know how well it ages today, to be honest. <laughs> um, not like offensive, but just, it's kind of corny. But that said, I would definitely play in this. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, you do the super hand-wavy history thing, and you could even fit in the, the greatest movie ever made in there is one of your adventures, 1982's Raw Force. Uh, just go watch the trailer for that, and you'll see what I mean. Anyway, I will talk to you later. Keep up the great work. And if you run this, let me know. I'll play in it. Hi, Jason. Thank you for that. Dicey Tales, I'm not familiar with. I will look that one up. One Shot RPG, the uh, the Pulp Rules. I happen to have heard that episode uh, that you did while I was driving up to Niagara, actually. And uh, it sounds like a cool system. But, um, yeah, in the end, I ended up making my own anyway. Another person that remembers the show. I, like I said, I thought I was the only one. But it makes sense that in the gaming circle, the circle of older gamers, that more people would remember this show because you know you have that adventuring mindset you know and back then there were only three channels no cable not a lot a lot of choices you said you uh don't remember how you're not sure how well it would age (laughs) 
well, we can trust James. <laughs> he said it's cheesy. So uh, I guess that's the answer to that question. And then you mentioned raw force. Um, yeah. Um, no. <laughs> uh, to each their own. Thank you very much for the call, sir. And uh, good luck with whatever you decide to do about your podcast. I support you either way. Uh, and I very much like that you chose to end the podcast rather than just pod fade. Um, yeah, pod fade is a sad end. And I like definitive end. I like it. You rock. Hey, everyone. You might notice if you're watching on YouTube that the camera angle has changed. If you're listening, maybe the audio uh, is a little different. What happened to is I got interrupted, but this is going long anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this one right here and we're going to come back next week and finish up the feedback. So thanks a lot for listening. Any comments, criticisms, feedback, anything you want, feel free to send it to feedback at deckhedron.com. On YouTube, you can put it in the comments down below. On the web, you can go to sayhi.chat slash deckhedron or you can phone 562-774-2278. Yeah, I had to look down and read that number. Um, that's 562-RPG-CAST. Anyway, I'd love to hear from you. As you can tell, me listening, uh, responding to all this feedback. Thanks again for listening slash watching. And until next time, happy gaming, happy life. Bye.